Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lipman coming to you from the Allen B. LeVan Innovation Center, which is a combined effort between Nova Southeastern University and the Commission on Broward County. Uh, today we have an exciting uh, guest. Uh, we have, as I always say to you, m most of these programmatic structures or needs come from questions that of the public, the people who view these shows. And there's so many <laughs> questions that come relative to uh, oncology and gynecology, both the both. And here we got a double double hitter. We got a uh, um, we have Dr. Michael Worley Jr., who is a physician, uh, and he is a gynecologic oncologist at Jupiter Medical Center. Tell us what a gynecologic uh, cancer therapy, uh, doctor is. Oh, no, thank you. I think that's a great way to start off because, uh, to be honest with you, you know, I, as far as human oncology, I wasn't aware of the specialty until I was in medical school. And so that's where I was first exposed to it. And the path to a human oncologist um, it really starts, it's, it's, you know, four years of college, four years of medical school. But then here, after that comes the additional training. So it's four years of an OBGYN residency. And then after that, that's where generally you're, um, uh, you become like a general practitioner of OBGYN. But if you wanted to pursue a fellowship training and be a human oncologist, it requires at least three additional years of fellowship training. Um, during that, that time period, you're getting trained primarily in surgery, because I think that's where uh, there's a big role of what a human oncologist does. But you also come out of fellowship board certified to deliver chemotherapy. And you end up having a great understanding of the radiation and all the patho, like the way cancers of the GYN tract um, develop. And, you know, to build off of that, what GYN cancers are, when we're talking about that, we're talking about cancers that arise in the ovary, the uterus, the cervix. Those are the cancers that we, we, uh, we, we typically treat. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, you know, after we finish up that training, you are trained to do the surgery and the chemotherapy um, and provide the social support for those patients that are, that are dealing with those types of disease. Now, not all human oncologists continue to deliver, do surgery and chemotherapy. It's, it, it's slightly over 50%. It's probably around like 60% of people who end up doing surgery and chemo. But for my, people like myself too, I, I, I am board certified to give chemotherapy, but there's a lot of human oncologists in, in the nation that primarily just focus on surgery because that, that can be a huge portion of their practice um, and keeps you busy enough and, and uh, to where you're focusing on one aspect of it. Let me ask you, uh, before I forget, I, I, I failed to let the people know, at what uh, hospital uh, do you work with and at? Yeah, so I, um, so I am only at Jupiter Medical Center. Um, so, and uh, I see patients at the Anderson Family Cancer Institute. Um, it's a great campus. It, it, um, I'm, they have all the resources that you need uh, compared to a major academic center, which is you know where I came from. So prior to joining Jupiter Medical Center, I was at the Dana-Farber and Brigham and Women's Hospital and served as the director of ovarian cancer surgery there and was there for seven years. Well, that's, that's a, a great, uh, shall we say, star on your shoulder because, the, the, I mean, the, that particular entity has been brought to our attention a number of times, not to demean or denigrate any other entity, uh, that, but uh, certainly that was a, a, a good stop in your forward in your career, I would assume. Oh, it was exciting. It was great training. I think that just the background on me is that I'm originally from Florida. I was born and raised in Florida. I went to undergrad at the University of Florida, did my uh, my medical school at Florida State University, but then left um, the state of Florida to do additional training. So I did my residency in New York City and then did my fellowship at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Um, I was there as an attending, uh, you know, and it was a great it was a great area to learn, um, a great area to, to be in practice and to start my career. Um, but, you know, the opportunity at Jupiter Medical Center presented itself. Uh, it's, a, it's an expanding and, and, and really, really growing um, uh, program. You know, I think that all the resources that we have, and I felt like I could give really, really good care and be part of something exciting, you know, closer to my family in Florida. You know, uh, I, before I forget to tell you, because you mentioned uh, living, going, uh, and having a relationship to Clearwater, uh, mm -hmm. you, you do know that uh, Nova Southeastern University has a major campus in Clearwater. It's the Karan C. Patel campus, 
uh, sitting right there. Just as you get over the bridge, you make the first right-hand turn. And we have, uh, we have a, 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 a unit of our College of Osteopathic Medicine there going and nursing and, uh, and there's a whole group of healthcare, uh, shall we say, professions that are sitting there. It's a huge venue. If you ever get an opportunity, because I know that you have a family and over there, uh, take a look. What are the, the, the questions that come to us are really direct. The, uh, some of them uh, sound like they're over simplistic, but they're not. Uh, that's why I wanted you to be one of our guests today. Uh, tell us what advancements have occurred in gynecologic oncology over, say, the last, I guess you say, since you were le left New York in your, your training. Okay, that's thank you. I think, I, I, full disclosure, I think I'm a little bit biased towards ovarian cancer because that's kind of like was the, my particular area of um, academic interest, uh, clinical interest, and the patient population that I, I managed primarily when I was in New York and then in, uh, in, in Boston. I still uh, manage a lot of patients, and, and part of the reason why I was recruited to Jupiter was to fill that need for ovarian cancer. So I do want to acknowledge that, that much of my interest and excitement uh, may lie in that area, but I do have other areas that excite me in gene oncology. Um, you know, when it comes to ovarian cancer, I think that compared to when I first started my training, so like, you know, let's say 15, 20, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, we had an understanding of where ovarian cancer came from. And it's not the ovary. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's decades worth of research to show that ovarian cancer actually starts in the fallopian tube rather than the ovary. Um, this theory, this explanation is, it has a lot of foundational uh, research supporting it. It explains kind of the biology, the behavior, the treatment of ovarian cancer in a much better way than the concept of thinking that it started in the ovary. Now, where that, that comes to play is in the past couple of years, there's been a huge focus and a huge emphasis on prevention of ovarian cancer. Um, if you, what the old thought was, if you remove the ovaries, you can help prevent um, ovarian cancer. If we, if we, if we pivot back and, and say that ovarian cancer doesn't start in the ovary, it starts in the fallopian tube, you know, that has a, that, that we can better target how to prevent ovarian cancer. So when you remove the ovaries in someone who's young, that has negative consequences because it uh, deprives the body of the, um, of the estrogen that's needed in, in, in someone who's young. Um, if you remove the fallopian tubes, that will not impact the ovaries. So now what is this, the standard of care in Canada and is in this gaining traction here in the United States is that removing the fallopian tubes um, at, at opportune times um, will, and, 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 uh, and it has been shown in Canada, at least in big population studies, to, to decrease the risk of ovarian cancer. We won't see these effects in the United States or other places for many more years, but that's where a lot of our understanding is going and interventions and even health policies are going, is that when, when opportunities arise to remove the fallopian tubes, it, it is a good strategy uh, to prevent ovarian cancer. Now, that's for most people. So like people that are undergoing a, a hysterectomy and, and not desiring fertility in the, in the future, but they're too young to remove their ovaries, removing their fallopian tubes at the time of hysterectomy makes sense. For people that desire um, you know, con permanent contraception, removing the fallopian tubes rather than just tying the tubes or doing some other method, those are, and that may be a good strategy for someone to prevent ovarian cancer. Now, all of this is in a general population. Okay, if someone has a high risk of developing ovarian cancer, it, those people are identified with genetic testing. Those people have a different version of ovarian cancer that may actually benefit from removing the tubes and the ovaries. But that, those, are, those are the minority of patients. The, the, the majority of patients that don't have a genetic reason uh, that, that their ovarian cancer may start, removing the fallopian tubes is probably the best strategy with the, the least amount of side effects um, for patients. So that's one area that I'm very excited about. Dr. Lay, you know, there's a, been a number of questions relative to a child birth or not birth, but, you know, having a child. And uh, at what point in time or at what, what, what are the options for the female population that have asked these questions relative to uh, the issue of, uh, of, of ovarian cancer? No, thank you. That's a, that's a great question and something that, that is really, really important and I, and I get all the time. Um, patients that are young, 20s and 30s, and, and uh, they have a concern for ovarian cancer, they want to be proactive and, and really be educated on what they can do to minimize their risk. 
Um, you know, all too often it may, it may seem that the reflexive and right thing to do is to remove the, the tubes and ovaries, but that does uh, make it more difficult for patients to, um, to have a, a child. And, you know, they, once their tubes and ovaries are removed, you cannot get pregnant in a, in a, in a natural way or, and the eggs are not um, yours anymore. Um, it also puts the patient to surgical menopause and there's consequences of that when they're in their 20s and 30s and are put into menopause too early. So you want to be thoughtful about um, reducing one's risk. Um, if, if a patient comes in and, and has a concern, you know, with respect to their risk of ovarian cancer, I think it's really important to quantify what the risk is, um, because someone who has an average risk of ovarian cancer in the United States, that's about 1%. Okay, so that's the average lifetime risk. If someone has a high risk genetic mutation, such as uh, BRCA or BRAC mutation, which is what Angelina Jolie had, her risk of developing ovarian cancer was uh, 40%. So when you, when you look at the difference between having a 1% risk and a 40% risk, the strategies to minimize that risk are very, very different. So if someone has a concern for ovarian cancer, asking the question to them, uh, you know, where does that, that concern stem from? If it's because they have a family history of ovarian cancer, I think it's really important to then have that patient undergo genetic testing uh, because we can confirm and say, this person has a genetic mutation, their risk is, is, is X, and, 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 and there are options that are standard of care to intervene and, and, and uh, decrease that risk. Um, if someone has an average risk, you know, again, after genetic testing and their concern was just from, they have a friend of ovarian cancer, they've heard it in, in the lay press. Um, you know, the strategies for those are very different. You know, talking with those patients and, and giving them a realistic expectations that um, there was no screening test for ovarian cancer. We don't have an ultrasound or imaging or PET scan modality that finds ovarian cancer early enough. Um, we don't have a blood test that does that. So really other strategies are, are really, really important. Um, things that someone can do, uh, you know, simply having a child, breastfeeding, uh, being exposed to birth control pills, all of those decrease the risk of ovarian cancer to some extent. So those are things that are important to educate patients that are average risk that want to do things to minimize their risk. The other thing that, that comes into is, is planning their family. Like if, if someone who's 20 or 30 and they want to end, uh, and they're concerned about ovarian cancer and they have an average risk, you tell them about those things, but then you say, let's you plan your family. Um, they move on, have, have, have their children, but if they ever at some point want permanent sterilization, such as like having your tubes tied, you know, that's the colloquial way of referring to it, um, or asking about contraception, you know, what I had spoke about before is that there's a lot of data now that shows that um, the ovarian cancer starts in the fallopian tubes. So potentially for that patient, the best strategy moving forward after they're done with trying with their, 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 um, their, uh, their family uh, planning and family sort of, um, uh, having their kids, you know, if they want sterilization or they want contraception, removing their fallopian tubes, you know, will allow for that contraception, but at the same time, uh, it will provide a reduction in the risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, I uh, sit on a couple of uh, national panels uh, where these, a lot of these discussions come up. And one of the things that was discussed recently within the last couple of months is that uh, genetic testing is something which is sort of, I guess, out of the range of uh, what I would call the general public. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, first, I, uh, in many cases, it's never covered by insurance. And I'm just wondering whether you now have a greater requ request from people at your venue or, or with colleagues' venues for genetic testing. Yeah, I think genetic testing has changed so much in the past 10 years. I think that uh, 10 years ago, I mean, we had fewer genes to test for um, that we knew were related to ovarian cancer. And um, you know, that area has definitely changed. Um, 10 years ago, when we thought about genetic testing, you know, the testing is relatively easy because it's a, it's a sample. It can be a blood test or a saliva um, swab. But really, what's in it? So it's not the hard thing of actually getting the test, but the counseling is important because, um, you know, uh, a typically what a patient does, they go and they speak with a counselor. The counselor sort of determines based off of the patient's concerns, their family history, what genes to look for that potentially could have mutation in it. The reason why it's focused is because if you just send off this huge, broad panel, you may get false positives. And what to do with those false positives or things that come up that are not necessarily positives, but there are sometimes reports that come out as having a variant in a gene, which we don't know what it causes. Many of these turn out to be nothing with further research, but it still it provides stress to the patient and, and, and doesn't have a good explanation for the counselor. So the counselor is really important. Now, what I think that we saw from COVID is, and I, and I saw this in real time, is that 
you know, having that interaction for genetic testing, we knew the importance of genetic testing, but going in and physically seeing a counselor um, you sort of was sometimes the rate limiting step. What people got very creative was with, with telehealth visits. So now they're, 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 as far as genetic testing, it's a, it's a strong need and people need it. People are asking for it. It's the standard of care for some diagnoses. Um, but access to it, I think, certainly has improved. It could go a much better. I mean, we can, we can definitely improve upon it, but at least access. Patients can start that initial counseling visit with, um, with a, you know, a telehealth visit in many different institutions, um, many different companies. So third-party companies have, have, have built upon this is that we can do genetic testing as a private entity and, and then do, do the counseling as a private entity and do it uh, virtually. And then what I mean by virtually is they, they'll do the counseling. And when I before I was a Dana-Farber, what oftentimes they'll do is they'll counsel the patient and then mail the patient the actual swab that may be a, an oral swab, and then that gets sent to the lab. These are the kind of strategies that, that came out of COVID to be able to pivot to provide care. Now, here, we're not in that environment anymore, but we still have those resources. You know, where I work currently at the, at the um, Anderson Family Cancer Institute, we have a genetic counselor. We just hired another genetic counselor. So our program is expanding, okay? And so this is what we're seeing based off of demand is that this is a resource that's necessary because it does impact counseling of the patient, but it also impacts therapeutics. Like when I, to build back onto ovarian cancer, you know, genetic testing is the standard of care for women diagnosed with ovarian cancer because if they have a genetic mutation, we want to know that because it may be linked to a, to a risk of another cancer. In addition, there are some therapeutics that are targeted, like some chemotherapy agents that are targeted to, to for patients with a BRCA mutation that allow improved survival if they have a BRCA mutation. So it has multiple different reasons why it's advantageous to do testing. Um, and then luckily, we're starting to see the... Um, the uh, supply for it increase as the demand increases. Well, you know, it's interesting because uh, I, I don't know how this, this statement came to be, but uh, I read somewhere and, uh, that we have such a high number of Eastern European nationals who have come to the, the state of Florida that mm -hmm. uh, we have one of the highest number of BRAC patients and I don't know how high that number is and where it stands, yeah. but it's interesting. You're, you're correct. And I think that there are certain, uh, um, you know, sort of like ra uh, racial and, and uh, populations that, um, and geographic populations that have a higher risk of developing a, or having a, in carrying a, a, B a BRCA mutation. Certainly it's Ashkenazi Jews. Okay. French Canadians also have a higher um, likelihood of having that, that mutation. And it has some real implications. You know, I think that you know, it's not just ovarian cancer, it's breast cancer, it's pancreatic cancer, it's melanomas. Um, so there's multiple different cancers that we're, that we're talking about and trying to minimize uh, those developing in people. Obviously, uh, you, have, you, have, you have to be collaborative with a number of colleagues, for example, surgeons, I, I mean, whatever, radiation, onco uh, other radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, and there has to be I guess, a, an understanding that you're each uh, on the same team. A hundred percent. I think cancer, cancer care is, is almost always collaborative, multidisciplinary care. I think that's the best way to provide comprehensive care to a patient is, is, um, is multi-specialty. Okay. And that multi-specialty may include surgeons, it may include radiation doctors, chemotherapy doctors, but it also may include nutritionists, nutritionists, genetic counselors, um, you know, social work um, um, support. All of those are important resources for, for any cancer institute, which, you know, we, we are lucky to have over at Jupiter Medical Center. Um, for, for some patients, their treatment may simply involve surgery, okay? But for many patients, you know, just some examples, like if someone has endometrial cancer, some of those are related to genetics, but many of those are related to dietary um, um, habits, um, obesity, things of that nature. So when someone comes in, has an endometrial cancer, we may cure them with just surgery alone and they don't need chemo, they don't need radiation, but they do need a multi-disciplinary uh, um, collaborative approach because that patient, you know, yes, you have you have been saved from your endometrial cancer, but the thing that's, that is harmful to you is the dietary habits, the lifestyle changes that, that predisposed you to get that cancer. So intervening upon that and saying like, uh, you know, referring you to nutritionists, talking with your primary care physician and educating you to say like, we come up with these strategies to prevent any future issues that come up in the, the, um, in the future. That's really important. 
But for patients that come in with advanced stage disease, metastatic or, or disease that spread to other areas or recurrent um, cancers, that oftentimes you're using all of these resources. And so it's really important to be able to provide um, uh, good comprehensive care when you have easy collaboration between, you know, offering a patient radiation, offering a patient surgery, uh, and offering a patient chemotherapy. Because often, oftentimes these conversations, we have to collaborate with our other providers, but then deliver to the patient, say, this is the right approach for you based off of your health, your wishes, uh, and your circumstances. Well, that, that, that's, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, thank goodness, I was going to say thank God, but I, you know, we, don't, we don't talk about religion on this program. But, the, <laughs> but I, I would say to you this, that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's wonderful that now we have uh, in medical presentation, medical care, and I'm sure that you saw it during your long history of being trained, uh, I mean, to so some people, four, eight years, twelve years is not a long time. But in 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 a life of a of a graduated medical student, it's pretty long. Sure. Uh, so, but uh, the 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 in, the invasive surgical techniques uh, and the minimally invasive surgical techniques. Uh, are really uh, new to a, a good number of your colleagues. Uh, sure. How do you get around that? No, I think this is great. I, that's that's another area that uh, that I'm very excited about because aside from being interested in ovarian cancer, um, you know, I have a great interest in robotic surgery, minimally invasive surgery. You know, my training of the the era that I trained, minimally invasive surgery, you know, complex laparoscopy, uh, complex robotic surgery. Uh, like really was the more common uh, area of training. You know, there are some procedures that that traditionally have been only been able to be done open through a big open incision because of the level of complexity. Well, what laparoscopy, what robotic surgery has evolved to be in, to be uh, at currently, um, you know, is we can offer complex procedures with the same cancer outcome. So they're the same good cancer outcome that previously could only be offered open. And we can now offer those, those patients a similar uh, or the same surgery with less blood loss, less complica fewer complications, less discomfort, and, and, a, and, a, and a quicker return to normal function. Now, there are some, there are some types of cancers that, that are more amenable to minimally invasive surgery. For instance, endometrial cancer, you know, uh, offering a patient a minimally invasive surgery, whether it be laparoscopic or robotic, is, this, is the standard of care. Uh, there are some patients that can't have that offered. Is like, but if someone has an endometrial cancer, the standard of care typically is a minimally invasive surgery with either laparoscopy or robotic surgery. Um, now, when you get into other areas or other diagnoses like ovarian cancer, the surgeries tend to be complex enough where it, 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 um, it, the minority of uh, patients can be offered a minimally basis surgery. So those, there's a time and a place for open surgery. But I think that with the advent and kind of the, the, the evolution of robotic surgery, we're pushing beyond what can be done uh, um, minimally invasively. Okay, so the one of the advantages of robotic surgery to laparoscopy is the the visual optics are much better when you compare robotic surgery to laparoscopy. The dexterity and the instrumentation is much more advanced when you compare robotics to laparoscopy. Now, all of that allows for more and more complex procedures to be done. And a lot of those complex procedures are cancer-based surgeries. So just in the past five years, if you compare surgeries that typically are only done open because of the level of complexity, the, uh, we are starting to see those uh, be able to be offered to patients in a robotic fashion, okay? And that's because of advances in technology. I, I think that the, the, that those advancements will continue. We'll continue to see what surgeries are offered to patients and are able to be done safely um, it, where robotically compared to open in the next five years and certainly the next 10 years, because there are advances that are being seen in robotic surgery um, and minimally invasive surgery in general. And there are some serious advantages when you compare it to open surgery. Well, Dr. Michael Worley, Jr., physician, great gynecologic uh, oncologist, we really appreciate you giving us some of your time. I know how busy you are. Uh, but, you know, there's a whole other area that I'd like to discuss at some point in time, and, and that's the, uh, the issue of uh, estrogen and progesterone and, and how it f fits into your, your area of responsibility. Uh, but sure. we'll, we'll have you back. Yeah, that's perfect. I'd love to. Okay. Well, uh, folks, like I said, uh, this, this program is called Dateline Health. Uh, we create 
this, we created this program, uh, I guess, uh, over 24 or 5 years ago, uh, because a lot of people wanted to know information. So this is an information program for you, the, the viewer. And uh, people like uh, Dr. Worley Jr. Uh, I don't know why they want, I'll call you Dr. Worley, how about that for a while, uh, is, is really very valuable to you because uh, that's what our purpose is, is to give you something uh, as to your questions and knowledge. This program is called Dateline Health. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. If you have any questions or, or you want to comment, and we'll send it on to Dr. Woolley. There's a, a, an email address and a phone number right here. And remember, take good care of yourself. And if you have any indications, you've got to see your doctors. Don't try to talk yourself out of it. See your doctor. Remember, again, my name is Fred Lippman. Until next time, see you.